Bacterial infections of oral cavity, uh, we know uh, there are a lot of bacterial infections occurring. So we will study the bacterial infections along with the oral manifestations so which we will encounter in our practice. Okay, The most commonest bacterial infection is the scarlet fever. Scarlet fever actually it is caused by the microorganisms streptococcus pyogenes. As we know, uh, we will be seeing the oral cavity. Sometimes uh, the pharynx uh, will be just inflamed. We will see uh, tonsils are inflamed. So the tonsillitis and the pharyngitis, they uh, just denote the inflammation because of this streptococcus pyogenes organism. So this scarlet fever, actually it resembles that uh, tonsillitis and pharyngitis, uh, the infection with that organisms because the Clinical presentation of uh, scarlet fever is just the same as the tonsillitis and pharyngitis. But along with that presentation, we get to see many presentations. So, we will study them in detail. Scarlet fever, it is also known as scarlatina. When it is occurring in, uh, when the presentations are seen in the mouth, it is known as stomatitis scarlatina. Okay. Uh, uh, characteristically, the scarlet fever, uh, it is uh, caused by alpha hemolytic streptococci, that is the streptococcus pyogenes and uh, it affects the children more commonly. So, uh, it is seen in very, very young children. So, the incubation period after uh, the individual acquires the uh, organism is th the 3 to 5 days. So, the initially the disease begins with uh, sore throat, fever, malice, pharyngitis, tonsillitis. Along with the inflammation, you get to see the regional lymph nodes are enlarged. So, that is the uh, general systemic symptoms and when when you are see, when you are seeing the scarlet fever along with the tonsillitis you get to see a characteristic rash on the skin that rash the appearance of that rash is diagnostic of scarlet fever so how is the rash seen why the rash appears actually the rash appears because of injury to the blood vessels there is dilatation of peripheral blood vessels that leads to appearance of these rash. The rash characteristically is a bright red diffuse rash occurring on the skin surface and if you just put pressure on it, uh, the rash blanches on pressure. So the this scarlet skin rash, it appears on the uh, second or third day of the illness. Sometimes uh, when, the, when the, this uh, scarlet uh, rashes, they are appearing in the oral mucosa, as I told you, Stomatitis scarlatina as it is called, erythematous patches are seen, along with that the rashes they show the appearance of a, uh, just a raised lesions on the rashes, the, giving that rash a sandpaper feel, it, it will feel rough if the rash is having some raised lesions on it. So here in the clinical picture you can see that the uh, rash, the characteristic rash up, uh, appearing on the child along with the symptoms of pharyngitis and tonsillitis. The rash is uh, diffuse in nature. It's a bright red pinkish rash, also called as the scarlet fever. So here, the how the individual uh, is showing the appearance of rash on the cheeks and on the trunk. Yeah, the rash usually begins on the trunk and then it spreads to the extremities. So, uh, oral cavity, it shows the presence of uh, macules on the hard palate and soft palate more commonly also on the tongue. So, the on the hard palate and soft palate, you get to see the bright red spots like thing. Those spots are nothing but the forshimid spots and characteristic symptoms of tonsillitis and pharyngitis, both the, the entire uh, uh, tonsillar pillar or the fascia, fascial pillars, they appear fiery red in color. They are inflamed, edematous and swollen. So the diagnosis of uh, scarlet fever is done uh, by, by the demonstration of organisms and uh, there is associated marked leukocytosis, the uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is elevated and the individual uh, the, has fever along with symptoms of pharyngitis, tonsillitis and rashes. So these three all together give an indication of a scarlet fever. Treatment for this as I told you it is caused by the alpha hemolytic streptococci, streptococci pyogenes. So antibiotic therapy is indicated, penicillin or in case of penicillin allergy, the uh, erythromycin 
may be suggested erythromycin or clarithromycin whatever they may be suggested so that's about the scarlet fever now we'll see the other uh, commonest bacterial infection that is the diphtheria as we have already studied in microbiology in detail the pathogenesis the clinical features we'll be correlating both the clinical features with the oral manifestations especially which we'll be encountering as a oral pathologist which we'll be seeing in the oral cavity okay actually diphtheria it is caused by an organism known as cornibacterium diphtheriae previously uh, it was thought that the disease is a inflammation which is associated with the characteristic pseudo membrane on the tonsils or fascial pillars so the diphtheria cases they were divided into two uh, uh, types that is the diphtheria cases and the diphtheria carriers uh, the individuals were called diphtheria cases when the pseudo membrane was present and the diphtheria carriers when uh, along with inflammation the diphtheria membrane was absent carriers when the membrane was absent characteristically uh, uh, the individuals the cornibacterium diphtheria it is transmitted Uh, through the droplet infection it is a airborne transmitted disease the organisms gain entry either through a small abrasion on the skin on the mucosal surface so once they uh, yeah we are inhaling a lot of substances right so when we are come in contact with an infected person the droplets or the airborne infection when we get, come in contact with it we just acquire the disease the portal of entry may be a airborne or nasal air route and break in the skin or continuity of the surface so the what happens is once the toxin enters into the body at the site of entry it just remains like that and from that uh, area it just uh, st starts releasing the toxins which are just diffused into the body resulting in toxemia and uh, clinical manifestations so the incubation period for cornibacterium diphtheria is nothing but 2 to 5 days so after initial entry the organism takes 2 to 5 days for the symptoms to develop so diphtheria initially as uh, i told you the it has lot of impact on the oral cavity how will study so the characteristic general symptoms include the appearance of fever malaise sore throat dysphagia and uh, as the inflammation involves the pharynx and larynx there will be hoarseness of voice and uh, limb, uh, dysphagia uh, in severe cases asphyxia re results because of involvement of the respiratory epithelium diphtheria is actually diphtheria organisms they are actually inhabitants uh, they characteristically inhabit the upper respiratory tract so upper respiratory tract infections are more common here so difficulty in breathing respiratory stridor uh, and when it involves the larynx laryngeal spasms are seen and uh, along with the presentation of this uh, characteristic features uh, whenever the inflammation is present we see that the cervical lymph nodes the submaxillary or the cervical lymph nodes are enlarged giving the appearance of a bull neck so here the child you can see the clinical picture the characteristic appearance of bull neck because of the involvement of lymph nodes that is regional lymphadenopathy so here the this this is a cutaneous lesion of uh, diphtheria it showing induration and this is this was actually the site of entry of the microorganisms the microorganisms uh, the, sometimes what happen is these are spore forming bacteria right they just remain dormant for years before you get to see the clinical symptoms when coming to the oral cavity especially you see that the appearance of diphtheric membrane that is the pseudo membrane is characteristic this pseudo membrane is um, actually it's inflamed edematous uh, with the appearance of grayish blue grayish or greenish uh, membrane on the surface of the tonsils or the fascial pillars actually this pseudo membrane it usually first it begins on the tonsil then it becomes confluent with the other mucosal surfaces even in the clinical picture you can just see the whitish or grayish color pseudo membrane it is very thick and it is exudative in nature uh, occurs along with that you get to see few of the non specific ulcers in the oral cavity which are very painful they may resemble the recurrent aphthous stomatitis ulcers and uh because of involvement of uh, edema and inflammation the soft palate it becomes temporarily paralyzed uh, so there are no sensations 
uh, the soft of the soft palate and dysphagia is there is respiratory strider is there along with that so the treatment for uh, the diphtheria diphtheria infection is nothing but administration of a diphtheria antitoxin diphtheria antitoxin in cases of non-immunized individuals. The other characteristic feature of this diphtheria infection is that once the individual gets the infection, he develops relative immunity to the infection so that re-exposure doesn't cause the infection. So diphtheritic infection, uh, characteristically in the oral cavity, you have to see the pseudomembrane to uh, just give it a case of a diphtheria. Diagnosis is by demonstration of the organism, Cornibacterium diphtheriae, by cytological smears or by staining. Treatment is administration of diphtheria antitoxin. Now we'll see the other common bacteriological infection that is the tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, it is a granulomatous infection. It is caused by Mycobacterium tuberculo, tuberculae. This uh, tuberculosis, as we know, when you say, whenever you say tuberculosis, all associate it with something with a lung infection. So the, the, there are two forms of tuberculosis. That is the pulmonary tuberculosis and extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Yeah, tuberculosis also affects the skin, the lymph node, the joint, kidneys, intestines, even the central nervous systems. So we have two forms: pulmonary one and the extrapulmonary one. Mycobacterium the tuberculosis. The interaction between the Mycobacterium tuberculae and the host leads to generation of the clinical manifestation. So what's the pathogenesis? What happens is once the bacilli, the bacilli are actually acid fast bacilli. So when they enter into the, uh, when they come in contact with the host immune system, there is activation of macrophages. This activation of macrophages is uh, actually the macrophages, they control the growth of the bacteria or sometimes the bacilli proliferate to such an extent, they just uh, lyse the macrophages and thereby there is accumulation of macrophages. This accumulation of macrophages leads to formation of granulomas which are the clinical presentations. Uh, because of activation our body has cell mediated immunity. It leads to activation of lymphokines. These lymphokine activation, they leads to just the degeneration, the development of uh, necrosis of the central cells that leads to formation of this uh, caseous necrosis in the center of the granuloma that is uh, called as the Rani's complex. This Rani complex uh, when it is seen in case of uh, hilar lymph node when it's involved the lungs hilar lymphadenopathy okay is seen along with that uh, the central caseous necrosis whatever is there it undergoes liquefaction degeneration and the cell, this the, there is sometimes discharge of this uh, caseous necrosis into the lungs that leads to development of a cavity in the lung uh, this cavity it may heal spontaneously by itself by fibrosis or it may persist for few years like that so the development of uh, uh, granuloma is clearly understood the pathogenesis how it develops the clinical symptoms as i told you they are just non-specific the occurrence of fever malaise weakness uh, the discomfort those are the actually non-specific features they are not indicating underlying uh, bacterial infection by the tuberculosis bacilli so along with that the cuff uh, as we have seen the pulmonary forms of tuberculosis, they are again of three types like primary pulmonary tuberculosis, secondary pulmonary tuberculosis and the tertiary or the miliary tuberculosis. So the primary pulmonary tuberculosis along with the characteristic symptoms of fever and malaise, they uh, show the occurrence of cough which is non-protective. When coming to the secondary pulmonary tuberculosis, along with the symptoms of um, fever, malaise and weight loss, you get to see cough uh, which is productive in nature that is hemoptysis that is coughing up of blood is also seen. So in cases of miliary tuberculosis, miliary tuberculosis is nothing but the extensive involvement of lung. So along with the fever, uh, the symptoms of cough, hemoptysis, pleuritic chest pain that is characteristic of the miliary tuberculosis and hemoptysis is severe here. So the extra pulmonary tuberculosis, as I told you, it involves the meninges, the lymph nodes, the bone, the genitourinary tract, the skin. Almost all uh, other major organs are affected because of the hematogenous spread of this infection. And 
loss of weight uh, along with the symptoms of fever malaise weakness and the cough that gives an that may give an indication of this disease okay and when uh, the tuberculosis uh, involves the whenever the tuberculosis infection occurs there is enlargement of the regional lymph nodes so tuberculous infections involving the submandibular and the submaxillary lymph node that is nothing but the scrofula here the lymph nodes they become enlarged they are very painful and that leads to uh, development of uh, abscess initially the inflammation it leads uh, the it leads to development of abscess this abscess then progresses ultimately uh, to leading to discharge of pus on the external surface uh, that's about the scrofula so when we see the oral cavity specifically in patients affected by the secondary pulmonary tuberculosis secondary tuberculosis secondary pulmonary tuberculosis the lesions uh, they may be appearing on the tongue characteristically although the lips buccal mucosa gingiva also may be affected but tongue is characteristic in secondary uh, tuberculosis it shows the occurrence of a ulcer which is non specific which is very very small and which is very painful okay irregular superficial or deep painful ulcer is characteristic of secondary pulmonary tuberculosis whereas in primary tuberculosis primary pulmonary tuberculosis uh, it involves the gingiva more commonly the gingiva becomes diffuse hyperemic and nodular showing the characteristic uh, inflammation and because the acid fast bacilli are uh, characteristic of this progression of inflammation there is proliferation of the gingival tissues and tuberculosis may also involve the skin that is nothing but the lupus vulgaris as it is called tuberculous infections of skin they also show the appearance of abscesses granulomas abscesses which are with discharging sinus tracts on the external surface it is a diffuse involvement of the skin and when we see characteristically the microscopic picture of a tuberculous infection the granuloma infection is seen along with the granuloma we see as we know the granuloma is shows characteristic appearance uh, of uh, lymphocytes it is a living tissue right it is a, the uh, occurrence of lymphocytes and uh, there is a central caseous necrosis as we have already discussed in the pathogenesis and the granuloma with the central caseous necrosis uh, which is surrounded by epithelioid cells langerhans gain cells and the histiocytes and the lymphocytes and multinucleated gain cells are more common and the diagnosis for this uh, tuberculosis can be done by this tuberculin test or the mantox test the Ma mantox test or tuberculin test is nothing but injection of 0.5 ml of purified protein derivative subcutaneously into the forearm so it leads to development of induration so if the induration is present within 48 to 24 hours it indicates that the test is positive and the individual has become immunized so that the individual had infection previously in life and he has become immunized so he may not develop uh, the infection he may not show the symptomatic infection if the induration is not present in 24 to 48 hours then uh, it indicates that the tuberculin test is negative and the individual is susceptible to tuberculosis in future and uh, when coming to when when we see the oral cavity especially along with the presentation of the ulcer the gingival hyperplasia the tuberculous bacilli they gain entry into the periapical region uh, through the pulp chamber of the tooth the pulp chamber of the tooth when there is periapical peri infection the root canal serve as a portal of entry the bacilli just enters into the periapical area it just becomes uh, It, it just becomes uh, concentrated in the periapical region and leads to formation of what is called as tuberculous granuloma the microscopic picture is of granuloma is again the same there is a formation of a granuloma with a central caseous necrosis with uh, infiltration by lymphocytes and multinucleated gain cells and langerhans cells that's about the tuberculous uh, granuloma and the tuber this uh, periapical infection periapical granuloma is there it eventually involves the bone so the bo bone of both the maxilla or the mandible may be involved by the diffuse spread of the infection and um, the inflammation just keeps on progressing to osteomyelitis so osteomyelitis tuberculous osteomyelitis of the maxilla and the mandible the mandible is more commonly affected by the tuberculous osteomyelitis the treatment for tuberculous infection is a multi drug therapy that is a uh, Uh, just not uh, a single drug uh, may not cure the disease so isoniazid rifampicin along with pyrazinamide have been indicated uh, 
uh, for about it is a nine month therapy if only isoniazid and rifampicin are followed if isoniazid rifampicin and pyrazinamide are given for four months then again uh, then iso isoniazid and pyrazinamide are maintained for other five months so it is a multi drug therapy because the tuberculous bacilli is known to develop resistance so we have seen the pulmonary form the extra pulmonary form of tuberculosis along with the characteristic oral manifestations now we'll move on to the other bacterial infection that is a leprosy leprosy it is also a granulomatous infection uh, it's also known as um, hansen's disease here this disease is caused by the bacterium known as the micro myco mycobacterium leprae the leprae the lep leprosy it is actually a very devastating disease it affects the skin uh, the lymph nodes and uh, peripheral nerves the in, these are the only organisms mycobacterium leprae which involve the peripheral organism peripheral nerves peripheral nerve along with skin involvement there are basically two forms of uh, leprosy that is the tuberculoid leprosy tubercul tuberculoid type leprosy and the lepromatous type of leprosy so what happens in um, leprosy is once the organism enters uh, into the human body it may remain dormant for about 5 years the incubation period is 5 years and the development of clinical symptoms it may take about 20 years so that mycobacterium leprae is unique in that uh, features that the clinical manifestations after infection are seen in about 20 years and uh, trans uh, the individual acquires the infection by transmission either direct contact with the affected individual through direct contact the bacilli enters our body if suppose there is a cut in the skin or the mucous membrane or anywhere along the body if uh, such an individual comes in contact with infected person he just acquires the infection that infection the clinical symptoms are seen only after about 20 years so initially you get to see when it involves the skin the bacilli involves the skin you see there are hyperpigmented patches there is erythematous patches they are seen on the skin along with that macular or papillar um, patches are seen and there is loss of cutaneous sensations uh the, if we see the pathogenesis of mycobacterium leprae what happens is the mycobacterium leprae uh, they when they involve the skin they lead to activation of histiocytes and when they also involve the squam cells the squam cells are nothing but cells which are present in the peripheral nerves so uh, they just lead to activation of uh, histiocytes and squam cells and thereby the clinical manifestations of peripheral nerve thickening and uh, loss of uh, partial or cutaneous sensation sensation in that area is just lost and the peripheral nerves get thickened so the tuberculoid and the lepromatous type show difference in the involvement of uh, lesions the tuberculomatous type of leprosy tuberculoid type of leprosy it shows single or multiple macular erythematous patches on the skin so tuberculoid uh, type of uh, leprosy it is seen along with the erythematous macules and papules that peripheral nerve is involved there is loss of sensation along with that uh, you get to see the characteristic uh nodules uh, there is the thickening of nodules whereas the lepromatous type of leprosy the papillar lesions same as seen in the tuberculoid type are seen erythematous and macular uh, papillar lesions along with that there is the progressive thickening of skin here so the characteristic nodules uh, are present they eventually lead to loss of uh, fingers uh, significant disfigurement and crippling is seen leprosy is basically a uh, a uh, disease of very chronic course it may not result in death but is uh, significant crippling and scarring is present if we see the fingers they the clinical picture uh, the nodular lesions ha, the finger it just become nodular initially because of thickening of the skin ultimately it leads to loss of fingers so it's a crippling disease sometimes it has been attributed uh, that the, there is a the involvement of the maxillary uh, division of the trigeminal nerve and it ultimately involves the seventh nerve also so there is paralysis or loss of sensation of that particular nerve trigeminal nerve and the seventh nerve so facial paralysis is common so the nodules may be seen in the skin face and ears so that's about the uh, lepromatous and tuberculoid type of leprosy when we see the uh, 
uh, oral cavity we get to see sm small tumor like masses those are nothing but lepromas the lepromas are more commonly seen on the tongue they are also seen on the heart palate or uh, the gingiva the lepromas actually they are small tumor like nodular lesions ultimately initially they be begin as nodular ultimately they ulcerate they just break down the gingiva when it is involved it becomes hyperplastic and when there is gingival hyperplasia there is loss of alveolar bone and the teeth become loosened and ultimately exfoliate and um, there is a paralysis of this maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve there is loss of sensation initially the touch sensation may be lost initially then it progresses to uh, paralysis so uh, and uh, and when it involves the teeth when we see the teeth there is a um, short maxilla maxilla is shortened there is hyperplasia of all the teeth the roots may be shortened so the hyperplasia uh, hyperplasia of teeth is seen so the lepromas a characteristic presentation of lepromas along with the appearance of nodules which ulcerate and the paralysis of the facial nerve and the trigeminal nerve and the shortening of root and hyperplasia are characteristic of lepromatous lesions and when you see the microscopic picture it is a granulomatous lesion right so the the appearance of a nodule is present the nodule shows collections of the epithelioid cells the lymphocytes the histiocytes then and uh, vacuolated macrophages sheets of lymphocytes are just scattered in the um, lesion in the nodular lesion those are nothing but lepra cells the lepra cells are vacuolated macrophages lysed macrophages the treatment for uh, lepromatous lesions include the multi drug therapy that is the rifampicin dampsol and clofizamine the three uh, uh, induce uh, 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 i mean sort of immunity to the infection but the disease is a chronic one it just keeps progressing and uh, it's a very very disfiguring one so we have seen the oral manifestations of a person affected with leprosy characteristically cutaneous manifestations are loss of fingers and toe and the thickening of skin and nodular lesions uh, that's about the lepromacy we'll see the other uh, common bacterial infection also known as actinomycosis a lot of time we uh, get to see the patients who just have uh, discharging sinuses present uh, on the facial region on the maxilla mandible anywhere on the skin uh, i'm uh, talking about the facial region so these discharging facial sinuses may be because of uh, underlying just infection of the surrounding tooth or uh, periapical periodontal infection or maybe a bacterial infection so the actinomycosis is of uh, great interest because uh, the disease uh, just shows the appearance of a sinus tract with discharging pus on the external surface the pus is characteristic in that when you study the pus microscopically the appearance of sulfur granules will be seen actinomycosis basically it's a bacterial infection is caused by actinomyces type of organisms a lot of actinomyces uh, have been demonstrated that is actinomyces israeli actinomyces viscus actinomyces nislindi and actinomyces odontolyticus actually actinomycosis it's a uh, actinomyces it's a um, common inhabitant of the oral cavity you can demonstrate actinomyces uh bacteria in the dental plaque uh the gingiva gingival sulcus in the calculus uh so these are common inhabitants of oral cavity when so actinomycosis actually it's endogenous infections because the organisms are common inhabitants of oral cavity some form of trauma might have occurred leading to uh, development of the inflammation by this microorganisms so any form of trauma uh, may be the initiating factor for this infection the according to dokation the actinomycosis infections have been uh, uh, divided into the cervical facial actinomycosis abdominal actinomycosis and the pulmonary actinomycosis so we'll see the cervical facial actinomycosis which has a varied clinical presentation on the uh, face facial surfaces cervical facial actinomycosis uh it's basically the bacterial infection it's more commonly seen in younger aged individuals about 20 years of age and males are affected more commonly uh the inflammation by this organism initially it begins as a swelling of the affected site the initial the site of organism the organisms actually they gain entry either through a break in the continuity of the skin or the mucosal surface so once it gains entry it leads to inflammation of that region le uh, leading to appearance of a swelling the swelling uh, 
occurs so that the peripheral or uh, the over overlying skin it appears hard in nature it becomes deep purplish in color okay so once the swelling occurs there is induration of the tissue typically abscess formation occurs and the abscess just drains to the external surface of the skin so these abscess uh, whatever pus uh, is discharged when uh, seen microscopically they show the characteristic sulfur granules the sulfur granules are characteristic only of the actinomyces infection that is the actinomycosis so uh, um, as i told you the skin uh, when it, whenever there is an abscess or a nodular lesion form the overlying skin it just becomes stretched it becomes hard it becomes um, purplish red in color and uh, because of uh, underlying pus uh, and the, the the swelling is hard in nature there is a feel of wood we get it and when you see the microscopic picture as i already told the granulomatous infection it is a, the characteristic microorganisms are diagnostic of this lesion and when, when you are, whenever you are taking the cytological smear for uh, isolation or culture of the organism you have to take care that uh, the sample whatever you are collecting is not mixed with the saliva because uh, the actinomyces organisms are common inhabitants of oral cavity so once the sample is mixed with saliva actinomyces definitely they will be demonstrated so saliva contamination should be avoided and uh, when uh, when in such cases where saliva contamination is avoided and the organism has been demonstrated uh, that gives the diagnosis of the actinomycosis so uh, the characteristic colony of microorganisms are seen the individual when you see the individual colonies they show the uh appearance of um, basophilia in the cells uh, but the peripheral ends of the cells they show only they show the eosinophilia so that gives the appearance basophilic cytoplasm is present only the peripheral ends of the cell they show eosinophilia and uh, that's giving the uh, appearance of a radiating filament from the center of the lesion peripheral radiating filaments the term ray fungus is applied to it treatment for this is uh, the nodular lesion with abscess is present so draining of the abscess if a sinus tract has been present just excision of the sinus tract has to be carried out along with that antibiotic administration uh, symptomly uh, it provides a symptomatic relief and heals the lesion uh, uh, progressively and uh, the other forms of actinomycosis there is the abdominal myco uh, actinomycosis along with the presentation of swelling it presents characteristic features of gastrointestinal disturbances like the nausea the vomiting the fever the malaise so along with swelling you get to see the uh, that the system is involved the git gastrointestinal system is involved when you see the pulmonary uh, form of actinomycosis along with the discharging pus uh, swelling and induration you get to see hemoptysis and cuff more commonly just the cuff okay so that was the about the actinomycosis infection actinomycosis infection now we'll see the other uh, disease other infection that is tetanus tetanus actually it's a clinical presentation it's a disease it's uh, also known as log jaw disease it's caused by the organism that is the clostridium tetani clostridium tetani is uh, commonly seen in uh, soil okay it's uh, just a common inhabitant of the soil and whenever uh, the person is having an injury or uh, a road traffic accident or uh, whenever the individual is coming in contact with the soil and there is a break of the skin there is a break in the skin there is a cut in the skin and uh, the the that particular area is coming in contact with the soil the organisms just gain entry and they have uh, effects on the neuromuscular system the muscular system and the general systemic health so the incubation period for this uh, clostridium tetani is about 3 to 4 weeks the symptoms of tetanus may be either generalized or localized uh, they they have uh, the organisms Uh, they show effect on the muscular system and the neuromuscular system more commonly so what happens in generalized tetanus is once the individual gains entry it just leads to spasm of the muscles so in case of generalized uh, tetanus uh, trismus of the masseter muscle is more common so the as we are dentists we are concerned with oral region so we can see stiff stiffening of this uh, masseter muscle the masseter muscle becomes very stiff and rigid there are spasms there is a con contraction there is a disturbance in the contraction and relaxation of the uh, 
muscles and uh, patient complains of pain in the neck there is a rigidity or stiffness and he is unable to swallow the food dysphagia is present because of marked rigidity he may present uh, to you as a clinical symptom and uh, so because of the characteristic facial appearance that is the rigidity of master muscle the individual gets a uh, name rhizus sardonicus that is rigidity of the facial muscles that is nothing but the rhizus sardonicus and even if you see the skeletal system is affected uh, the back of the individual it just becomes arched because of the marked rigidity and stiffness of the skeletal muscles that is nothing but the opisthotonus so here you can see the clinical pictures the facial expression of the individual so the, when you see the characteristically the master muscle is just a tight or he may have inability to open the mouth or dysphagia and uh, neonatal tetanus is also present yeah when the mother has uh, the tetanus infection and it is just transmitted to the child by birth the neonatal tetanus or neonatal tetanus it's more commonly seen when the umbilical cord of the infant is cut uh, is cut with an unsterilized instrument uh, that is also uh, leading to rigidity of the skeletal system and so the the individual just demonstrates and you can see in the lower picture also the characteristic uh, the arc the back shows arc dull arc arc the characteristic arc that is called as the opisthotonus it's not stiff the back is not stiff and uh, the these are the generalized uh, symptoms of tetanus uh, and uh, the local tetanus is nothing but the area whatever uh, wherever the organism enters uh, that that particular area shows the spasm of muscles that is the localized tetanus so whatever be because of, uh, when the tetanus uh, infection involves the respiratory system uh, when the clostridium tetani they inhabit in the respiratory tract they lead to spasm of the laryngeal muscles uh the trachea or bronchi are affected uh, there is a uh, uh, airway restriction so the clinical management should include at attempts to maintain the airway first sedation airway and nutrition should be maintained antibiotic prophylaxis antibiotic has to be recommended and prophylactic doses of uh, tetanus have to be given first the wound has to be debrided of the organisms whatever is the source of entry it just has to be debrided and then booster dis disorders of tetanus toxin have to be given syphilis is other bacterial infection it's uh, caused by treponema pallidum uh, it's also known as lewes disease so treponema pallidum is the main organism causing syphilis syphilis it's uh, having a lot of forms there is the acquired form of syphilis and the congenital syphilis and the acquired type of syphilis it's again divided into primary secondary and the tertiary syphilis congenital syphilis are uh, uh, seen in infants so acquired syphilis acquired syphilis is the form of syphilis which is acquired right it is acquired because as a venereal disease in case of sexual transmission um in uh, by the infected partner uh, that's the most commonest cause of acquired disease so the incubation period once the organism enters uh, the incubation period ranges from about 3 to 90 days for the primary stage so after 3 to 90 days you get to see the clinical symptoms the characteristic symptom of the primary stage of syphilis is a chancre lesion so what's chancre we'll study Uh, actually, the primary stage of syphilis is most commonly seen in uh, younger aged individuals or uh, adolescents, adolescent or young adults about 20 years of age, and males are affected more commonly. So, the primary uh, syphilis or the chancre lesion, it is just an elevated ulcerated nodular lesion present either in the skin or when coming to the oral cavity, the tongue more commonly shows the presentation of the chancre. also heart palate lips and genital areas are also showing the chancre lesion it is just an elevated ulcerated nodular lesion so that's the presentation of a primary stage syphilis chancre lesion which is seen on the tongue uh, it's showing a local induration uh, sometimes you may mistake it for a recurrent aphthous stomatitis but it is non exudative it, it is just fixed to the underlying uh, tissue it is showing induration and regional lymph nodes are enlarged 
invariably you can see the presentation of other when you see a ulcer in the oral cavity along with the similar chancre like lesion in the skin definitely it gives a diagnosis of a primary uh, syphilis secondary stage syphilis uh, the ch the chancre actually it just resolves on its own it may take few months few weeks or few months to, uh, for the lesion to resolve secondary stage syphilis it occurs about 6 weeks after the primary lesion appears or after the primary lesion is seen 6 weeks after that we get to see the secondary stage of syphilis secondary stage of syphilis you can see the clinical picture it is characterized by diffuse eruptions erythematous eruptions which are seen on the skin the eruptions may be the macular lesions or the papillar lesions these macules and papules are painless uh, so just the uh, diffuse eruptions may be seen all over trunk uh, extremities face all will be involved even the palms and soles are also involved so the it is characterized by the appearance of mucus patches primary syphilis uh, chancre was characteristic mucus patches are the characteristic type of lesions in the secondary stage of syphilis these mucus patches when uh, seen in the oral cavity they uh, characteristically show the appearance of papular lesions along with the appearance of grayish white plaques ultimately they lead to ulceration and uh, the the mucus patches they are highly infective in nature so whenever you, you come in contact with an individual with such in, uh, lesions as a healthcare professional you will be a dentist you will be operating in the oral cavity and uh, the, if the individual has mucus patches and if you come in contact with that lesion uh, there are high chances of the bacilli uh, bacteria being uh, transferred to you and you getting the infection so mucus patches are highly infective and spontaneous remission that is, of the lesion is seen that is the lesion just heals by itself it may take a few weeks for the lesion to resolve loose maligna it's nothing but the diffuse involvement of the skin tertiary syphilis tertiary syphilis uh, is the lesion which is non infectious it is seen about many many years after the uh, primary infection that is about 20 years or 10 or 20 years after the primary stage of syphilis so the tertiary infection uh, stage of syphilis it is characterized by gamma type of lesion gamma type of lesion is nothing but a nodular lesion which is granulomatous in nature so they may be appearing on the skin uh, mucous membrane liver testis and even bone splenomegaly is also seen here so what uh, when uh, how are the lesions when they, whenever the lesions uh, the gammatous lesion is seen it is a granulomatous lesion with which, which is exhibiting the central necrosis when it, coming to the oral cavity uh, we get the gammatous lesion appear as a form nodular mass on the tongue or uh, the presentation may be of a painless ulcer so here you get to see the involvement of skin by in the tertiary stage of syphilis these both uh, the, uh, the facial tissue and the back of the patient they are just demonstrating the tertiary stage of syphilis the tertiary stage of syphilis is a gammatous lesion that is a focal granulomatous lesion with necrosis the blackening of skin characteristic back blackening of skin denotes the progression of inflammation to necrosis congenital syphilis is nothing but a prenatal syphilis which is transmitted from the mother to the child so the characteristic appearance of uh, individual at birth uh, the characteristic features are the appearance of a frontal bossa a short maxilla and uh, mulberry molars mulberry molars are nothing but the the shape of the molars uh, it just changes to a moon color moon shape yeah it, it just changes to a moon shape that's why the name mulberry molars is given and uh, the Molars, they show uh, occurrence of globules on the surface of the crown or buccal surfaces and the occlusal surfaces. They just appear as globular lesions. Small uh, globules of enamel may be seen on the occlusal surface of molars. That is nothing but the mulberry molars. And uh, there is even the hypoplasia of the incisor and the molar teeth. And the uh, higomenaki sign is nothing but the characteristic uh, sternic uh, clavicle. Clavicle shows the uh, deformation that is the sternoclavicular portion of uh, clavicle is deformed that is nothing but the higomenaki sign and there is the protuberance of the mandible so the Hutchison's triad 
that is the appearance of hypoplasia of incision and molar teeth eight nerve deafness and uh, interstitial keratitis these three denote uh, symptoms which are seen in the congenital syphilis so congenital syphilis is characterized by the hutchinson striate and uh, appearance of mulberry molars and the uh, in um, hypoplasia of even the incisor teeth hutchinson's incisors they are actually screw driver shape if you can see the clinical picture there the hutchinson's incisor they show a notch in the center they show a notch in the center and uh, the mesial and distal edges of the crown are just constricted so that's about the hutchinson's incisor and the mulberry molars these are characteristic features of congenital syphilis so what is the uh, presentation oral presentation as we have seen that is either a nodular lesion or a ulcerative lesion so when you see the microscopic picture you get to see that the epithelium it may be hyperplastic in few cases or uh, it may be ulcerated that is there is loss of uh, continuity of epithelium and uh, in primary stages it is particularly ulcerated whereas in secondary stages it may be either ulcerated or hyperplastic epithelium and the connective tissue obviously the progression of inflammation is there so you get to see the inflammatory infiltrate uh, chronic inflammatory infiltrate uh, which is particularly seen around the blood vessels that is the lymphocytes and plasma cells are more commonly seen and to to diagnose the individual by this uh, syphilitic lesion the clinical pictures alone are diagnostic so if you want to give a histological diagnosis you have to uh, carry out the dark field examination to identify the tri triponema pallidum examination of smear is done to dem demonstrate the organism that is the triponema pallidum so that's about the bacterial infection now we'll see the noma noma it's actually a disease is a very very serious bacterial infection uh is a devastating bacterial infection actually it's more commonly seen in malnourished individuals so the individual who has been suffering from syphilis tuberculosis or other infections uh, they are already debilitated and in such individuals this noma uh, the clinical presentation of uh, gangrenous uh, stomatitis or noma is seen so noma is also known by other names as cankerum oris or gangrenous stomatitis it is predominantly seen in children so as we told you predisposing factors are malnourishment and occurrence of other debilitating diseases so actually noma it's a secondary complication of a uh, debilitating disease we can say okay initially the noma it uh, begins with uh, as a small ulcer on the gingiva so this small ulcer it rapidly the inflammation keeps on uh, progressing it just spreads to involve the jaws lips and cheeks by gangrenous necrotic gangrenous necrosis ultimately the inflamed and edematous tissue just tends to slough off uh, when it involves the palate the palatal tissue becomes edematous and it just soft tissue just sloughs off so and uh, the gangrenous stomatitis it's associated with the foul odor Uh, the necrotizing organisms are present initially the organism was thought to be just a vincens infection there is acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis we know it's caused by the vincens infection right so the disease begins initially with as a uh, presentation of acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis by vincens organisms and then it progresses to uh, be complicated by uh, involved by other microorganisms the streptococci staphylococci and then the inflammation just progresses very severely ultimately uh, initially the lesion is reddish in color dark reddish in color with the inflammation uh, progressing it becomes blackened in color and there is a clear line of demarcation between the normal tissue and the edematous tissue so here you can see the clinical presentation of the disease the noma uh, necrotizing stomatitis as we call so it begins as a gingivitis acute, acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis and progresses the black color skin involving the mouth of the child is seen here there is diffuse gingival hyperplasia with characteristic uh, involvement of the lips and the jaws and there is a, a line of demarcation between the normal tissue and the gangrenous tissue treatment for uh, uh, noma includes the uh, antibiotic therapy as soon as uh, it started and excision of uh, whatever uh, gangrenous tissue is there to invariably to prevent the spread of infection
पायोजेनिक ग्रैनुलोमा पायोजेनिक ग्रैनुलोमा इट्स ए नॉन स्पेसिफिक इन्फेक्शन एक्चुअली इट्स अ ट्यूमर लाइक ग्रोथ सीन इन द ओरल कैविटी बट इट इज सपोज टू बी कॉज बाय सम माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिजम्स ओनली इनिशियली इट वाज थॉट दैट इट्स अ बोट्रियोमैटिक इन्फेक्शन दैट इज इट इज अ इन्फेक्शन व्हिच हैज बीन एक्वायर्ड फ्रॉम द हॉर्सेस बट लेटर ऑन लॉट ऑफ ऑर्गेनिजम्स लाइक द स्ट्रेप्टोकोकाई हैव बीन इम्प्लीकेटेड एज कॉजिंग दिस पायोजेनिक ग्रैनुलोमा so pyogenic granuloma it occurs on the lips tongue and buccal mucosa it appears as a elevated sessile pedunculated nodular lesion which uh, has as a content of a, it's a smooth vascular mass actually uh, which is showing a warty appearance ulcerated in nature and a warty appearance so this ulceration leaves uh, because it's a vascular mass there's a tendency for hemorrhage the vascular mass gives it a color of a deep red or reddish purple uh, actually noma it's a non specific infection uh, there is other common form of uh, this non specific infection occurring pre pre predominantly in the pregnant women that has been termed the pregnancy tumor but the term is a misnomer uh, because uh, even in other males and non pregnant women also such kind of uh, non specific nodular growth is seen okay when we see the uh, microscopic picture the epithelium is very very thin it's just atrophic or sometimes when the when the ulceration is present the epithelium may be hyperplastic and uh, the pyogenic granuloma uh, it predominantly affects the gingiva and uh, pregnancy tumor it's seen in the third month of pregnancy and probably it's actually a tissue reaction to the infection the presence of a calculus or an irritant in the gingiva it just causes a uh, uh, exaggerated response to the irritation and leads to development of a nodular mass which is similar to this pyogenic granuloma and uh, and it, it is present after the even after the delivery or sometimes it regresses after the delivery you just have to excise the lesion and you have to take care that the area is free of uh, calculus again uh, so the presence of calculus and uh, in cases of pregnant women the already lot of endocrine hormones will be acting so they present a exaggerated response to the irritation or inflammation so this pregnancy tumor is just uh, clinically similar to pyogenic granuloma so the treatment for both pyogenic granuloma and pregnancy tumor is uh, surgical excision surgical excision okay so we can see the microscopic picture of uh, pyogenic granuloma the epithelium is very very thin there and there is hyperplasia uh, hyper in lymphocytic infiltration is present and uh, the endothelium lined vascular spaces there is the blood vessels show proliferation there is a uh, the blood vessels are lined by and predominantly by endothelial cells and occurrence of uh, fibroblasts is seen and the pregnancy tumor also has a identical histological picture so we have seen the major bacterial infections with their characteristic oral manifestations uh, of oral manifestations which we will be encountering which we will be seeing